we're studying tonight is what it means to be um, victorious, a conqueror, overcomer. And the irony of all this is those people actually are the conquerors. And they're being conquered. What? You know, and that's, that's actually the story of Revelation. That's why the emphasis on persecution is so important, I think. What we're going to be looking at tonight, and the sheet I handed out is a, an indication of that. Yeah, we're going to kind of use what Jesus says at the end of his letter to the Ephesians to kind of look at the broader con- concept of the whole letter, the whole vision, which is the conquerors who are the followers of Jesus. So let's review just by reading the chapter again. I keep reading it while we're in it. And I'm hoping again that repetition will be a blessing to you. The first letter is only seven verses, you know, so we're, that part will be reviewed for what we've been looking at so far. The rest is a, a preview of what we'll be getting into, God willing, as we go. All right. Are there two people willing to read this for us? We'll break it up into verses one to uh, a, what? one through eleven, and then twelve to the end. We'll do that first question. All right. I'll do, do one through eleven. Will someone take twelve to the end for us? All right. Do it. All right, I'll just take it away. <clears throat> to the angel, we are in chapter 2. Yeah, chapter 2, 1 through 11. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven gold <clears throat> lamps, golden lampstands. Lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name, and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. To the the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for ten days. Be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt at all by the second death. To the angel of the church in Pergamum write, These are the words of him who has the sharp, double-edged sword. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. Yet you remain true to my name. He did not renounce your faith in me, not even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city, where Satan lives. Nevertheless, I have found a few things against you. There are some among you who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin so that they ate food, sacrificed to idols, and committed sexual immorality. <coughs> Likewise, you also have those who hope to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Repent, therefore. Otherwise, I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give some of the hidden manna I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. To the church, of the, to the angel of the church in Thyatira, write: These are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, 
but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely, unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Now I say to the rest of you, Uriah Taylor, to you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called <coughs> secrets, I will not impose any other burdens on you, except to hold on to what you have until I come. To the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. That one will rule them with an iron scepter and dash them to pieces like pottery, just as I have received authority from my Father. I will also give that one the morning star. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Amen. Ooh. You know, as we were reading this again, because we've been repeating it over and over, a story came to mind. I'll just share it with you because I don't want to not share it with you. I was reading an email about persecuted church and things. and It's a really cool story that gave me a little, little kick in the pants, a little perspective. And there's a man who serves, um, he helps train pastors in other countries where they don't have seminaries and they don't have resources like that. And so he was teaching them the word. And there's a group of, I don't know how many pastors, probably not a large group, from this area of, com- of communities. And so he, as he was talking, they would frequently kind of raise their hand and say, I'm sorry, sir, is that your words or is that the Bible's words? And at some times he'd be like, okay, those, those are the Bible's words. And he'd say something else, like, excuse me, sir, I'm sorry, is that your words or the Bible's words? And he'd say, that's my words. If he said they're the Bible's words, they had a notebook over here and they'd write it down word for word. If he said those are my words, they'd have a separate book and they'd write those words down word for word. So after it's all done, and he, he, you know, that kind of makes you feel good, but after it's all done, they had a little exercise between the pastors and the leaders of the churches. And one of the older ones stood up, he seemed like one of the well-respected ones, I said, okay, brothers, uh, time to do our, our, I don't know if he said drill or exercise or training or whatever. Uh, he said, what does Micah 10, verse 6 say? And the pastor who was teaching them said, I was hoping he wasn't asking me because I had no idea <laughs> what to say. And then the pastor kind of chuckled and said, there's no Micah 10, don't worry about it. No, there's only like seven chapters in Micah. So then he threw out a real one. What does Nahum chapter 2, verse 1 say or something like that? And several of the brothers in the place raised their hands, and one of them stood up. No, this one's from Isaiah. He stood up, and he quoted the verse. Well done, brother. And then he was, the, the lead guy was about to move on to the next one, and he said, may I continue? Oh, sure. And so from memory, he just continued the prophecy of Isaiah for verse after verse after verse. And what, what the, I don't know if he was American, I'll say Westerner, what the Westerner guy there to teach them learned was that as hungry as they were for the word, it was not because they didn't know it. They just didn't have it in print. But whatever they had had, they had been socking that away. It was in their hearts and minds. They could, like this, they could recite it to each other. Oh my gosh, I was just... I love these people. I just... I can't wait to meet them. Oh, spend forever talking to them. Okay. Anyways, I hope that encourages you. He kind of reminded me I need to keep working on my memorization of the word too. All right, so let's review what we've seen so far in Ephesus, and then we'll get to the last verse of this letter. Remember that Jesus, after appearing to John, either as himself or through his angel, however that works, and John records these details, uh, Jesus had told him ahead of time and reiterates, you need to write down what you're seeing and send it to the seven churches in Asia. And so he's now dictating letters through John to the, le- to the churches in Asia Minor, which he lists them, and the first one is Ephesus. <clears throat> so, these are actually Jesus' words to his own churches. This is not the Apostle John giving them words. This is Jesus himself to his churches. Remember when it says in verse 1, to the angel of the church in Ephesus, that word literally means messenger. So, we're having to figure out, is this an angelic being, like from heaven, or is this a human messenger? Another idea is it was the one responsible to read to the congregation. Because one person would read a letter and everyone else would listen. So whoever this person is, write to them because they're going to get it to the church. 
Jesus re- reiterates what John already saw and described, which is that he holds the seven, in- seven stars in his right hand and walks among the golden lampstands. Remember that, I think, is the reason he said that to this church is because this is the church he warned, if they don't repent, what was he going to do? Amen. I'll remove your lampstand from its place. So I think this reminder that he's among them and has the authority holding them is his way of reminding them before the warning, I could do that. <laughs> that's, that's my position here. I could do that. Um, what did he praise them for? So far, he knows their deeds, he says. He says he, he is happy for their hard work, really hard work, that they persevere. Uh, they don't tolerate that which is wicked or those who are wicked. They've tested the, the people who claim to be apostles but aren't, so they've been really careful about preserving the purity of their doctrine and of their practices. They've been really good at that. He says, you have persevered and have endured hardships for my name. So when they're, when they're um, hit from the outside, they stand up under it and keep going. They haven't grown weary. So this is a really great, encouraging word from their master so far. But then he gets to his big rebuke. And what is Jesus' big rebuke? Forsaking the love the first time. Yep. They have abandoned, they have, remember that word actually means to throw away from you, to cast away from you, it's the word for divorce. So they have utterly rejected their first love. We talked about this last week, what does that mean? And there's no way of knowing for sure, absolutely sure, what Jesus meant there. I tend to believe that he was talking about the love that they showed each other especially, their love for each other. They had, they had forgotten that. In their desire to be pure, they had forgotten their first and chief obligation is to love each other deeply from the heart. Now, notice what he says there, because we didn't really cover this last time. We talked more about their need to repent and what he might do to them if they didn't. But notice in verse 5 he says, Consider or think on how far you have fallen. And, and I find this really interesting because... He's done this to me too, and I'm wondering if he's done this to you as well. Your master, just like he did to Israel, he will take you back to former things. And it's not like just the good old days. He's like, you you can have it. You did have it. You need to get back to that. Because we all know that when you first come to the Lord Jesus, there's this clarity. It's the most important thing in the world. This is woo! And you get baptized. And it's, yes! And then, you know what the saying is, familiarity breeds contempt. Now, I don't think most of us have contempt for Christ or his way, but I think we, we get the vibe that once it's yours, once you have it for a while, you, you can easily lose the zeal of that. And that's true for your love for your brothers and sisters, too. This happened to me. I've seen it happen to other people. You first start to get into this wonderful rhythm and harmony with folks. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you one thing that, this strikes about me. I, I'm thinking of a, a small group I was a part of back in Lancaster that had this sweetness of fellowship that I, I don't know if I'd ever had it before with a group of Christians. And we'd get together and do just simple church, church things together. And then I moved away. And I was still meeting with them when the decision was made that we were going to be leaving. And it was, oh, those are the hardest times for me to have to say it was these people because of the beauty of what we had going on. And it's just like in high school when you're signing all these yearbooks and saying, oh, we're going to stay in touch. We're going to be best friends forever. You know, and in my mind, I meant it. I was going to stay in touch with these people. I love them. They're so important to me. Not that I don't love them anymore. Not that they're important to me. But I'm here. And I have all these other people that have that building that relationship with here. And so I kind of see stuff on Facebook and I'm just like, oh man, what happened? So I don't know that the Lord's going to condemn me for that part of it. That's a different creature. But it just it made me think of that. Like think back to that that fellowship you shared with them. Think back of what you can have when you really take each other seriously and my gospel seriously. Would, would that be something comparable to the parable he taught about the seed? That there's these people that, you know, you hear the word and they'll take it. Mm. Sort of. That's, that's a good thought. Because 
Uh, actually, that's an excellent thought because in one of the descriptions, I think it's of the, um, the rocky soil. He says that someone receives the message of the kingdom with joy. He says that with joy. You could just picture that. Woohoo, I've got the kingdom. The kingdom's here. Yay. And then when the persecution comes, well, not quite as exciting now. Like, I thought the kingdom meant all yay, and now the kingdom means ouch. I don't know if I want this. So I think that's a great connection you just made there. The joy can easily fade when you start to realize more and more, oh, this is more than I bargained for. Now, uh, again, I think in the case of the Ephesians, it wasn't, they didn't lose it. In that parable, the person just doesn't have the kingdom. I think in their case, they were in danger of losing it because they focused on something good and lost sight of what's best. And the good that they focused on was being pure. And the best that they lost track of was loving. So that's, that's not a hard thing to do. All right, so let's jump into verse 7. I love this so much. And this, um, this first part of it, the first sentence, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You're going to find this is a part of the pattern through each of the letters. So at the end of every letter, this is the, the first letter, and it's not at the end of the letter, but all the other letters have this at the end, after his promise to the overcomer. Uh, I just want to touch on this, not very long, but I just wanted you to know, because so much of what we're seeing in Revelation goes back to the Old Testament. Guess what? This language is very much like the prophetic language to Israel, the concerns of God about how they're listening and hearing. So I just wanted to point out a few of the passages in the Old Testament that have a similar concern about how the people of God are listening. Um... Deuteronomy 29, verse 4. This is Moses in his grand, if you want to call it a sermon, all right? But it's before he goes up and dies and they go into the promised land. This is his last call to the Israelites to be faithful. And he says, To this day Yahweh has not given you a mind that understands, or eyes that see, or ears that hear. This is a man who has been with a very stubborn group of people for a very long time. <laughs> He's like, to this day, I'm about to die, y'all. And to this day, you still aren't listening, aren't getting it. You're not seeing it. And so that was happening, of course, and we know that story well. They were so, they were so prone to grumbling and complaining and just not obeying God. In Psalm 115, verse 6. This is not people, this is the idols of the land, but he uses similar language. They have ears, but they cannot hear. Again, that's not the humans he's talking about, but it kind of relates to the humans who are worshiping them. In Isaiah chapter 6, verse 10, this is where God is calling Isaiah to serve, right, and to preach to the people. And this is what God told Isaiah. Make their ears dull and close their eyes. With their pre this is chapter 6, verse 10. By announcing my message to them, make their ears dull and close their eyes. What? Yeah. I thought that was the opposite of what we wanted, Lord. <laughs> I would be confused if God said that to me. He says, otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. This is something Jesus referred to when he explained why he's telling the parables. Because, when, and, and this is, I think, I think, Partly tongue-in-cheek on God's part. This is God's commentary on the stubbornness of his people. Isaiah, you know what the effect is going to be if you tell them the truth? It will cause them to close their eyes and shut up their ears. Because they don't like the truth. Isaiah, that's the problem. You know, and he's kind of getting Isaiah ready for that rejection. In Isaiah 32.3, this is actually a promise of the coming days of the Lord. He says... Then the eyes of those who see will no longer be closed. Just stop there. That's weird. People whose eyes are seeing are supposed to be the eyes that are open. Blind people, you might say, their eyes are closed. How strange that he says, in those days, the eyes of those who see will be opened. I just read a book today, and it, it had a quote by Helen Keller, and it says, <coughs> how terrible it is to be blind and not see. 
but how worse yet it is to have eyes and not see. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. That woman, she blow me away every when time. When you just yeah. said that, that just seems, I wonder if she was reading about that from the Bible. Yeah, that's very much like the language we're seeing here. He also said, the ears on that day, the ears of those who hear will listen. And there's more, there's so many more. But I just wanted to give you that, that notion that when Jesus says this to his people, he's very, saying it in a very prophetic way, the way the prophets would have said. Let him who has ears to hear, let him hear it. Just because you have ears doesn't mean you're going to hear. So you have to purposefully, you have to, um, with focus, you have to hear what I'm saying, I think is what he's getting at there. By the way, Jesus himself said this, whoever has ears of them here, multiple times in his earthly ministry, while he was teaching the people. He would say that same thing. And why would he say that to the people over and over again? Because he had learned through the experience of the prophets. If I tell my people the truth, a good number of them are going to purposefully close their ears and shut their eyes. So he had to keep reiterating, now you're going to have to purposefully hear this and see this, because it's going to be hard to take. Would you say some of Jesus' teachings were hard to take? Oh, yes. Even harder for the Jews. Not because they're worse people, but because the things that they held sacred was, was, was he was attacking. We have not held them as sacred as the Jews is because of what he taught us. And here we are all these years later being just as stubborn and stupid. Oh, I tell you. <laughs> yeah, notice he had to say that to the Christians too. It was not just to the Jews. That's How many right. How times do you hear people say, I have uh, selected? Selective hearing loss. Yeah, mm -hmm. you're right. And oftentimes it's somebody trying to be funny about their marriage or, you know, whatever else, or their kids. It's not so funny when it's God, is it, you know? I think the Holy Spirit can tell us that, like, when we come to service, we want to receive. But if we come to service and we want to maybe not receive, the Holy Spirit can say that to us. Yes, you're right. There's something that you are bringing forth through the Holy Spirit to somebody that doesn't want to receive it. Mm -hmm. Maybe, I don't know. Yeah. Maybe. I'm talking about myself sometimes. Because it's true. Yeah. You know, and truth will reveal what's really in us. You're right. So. And when, look, Jesus said it to Nicodemus in chapter 3 of, of John. He said, those, those who sin want to stay in the darkness because they're afraid they'll be exposed by the light. That's true. That's what the word does. I was thinking about this yesterday, actually. I was walking back to the house. I don't know what brought it to mind. I've said it and I've heard others say it. We'll say things like, that message was good. Or that message is really good. Or I really like that message. And I was thinking to myself, a message based on God's word could be good even if I didn't get anything out of it. Yeah. Even if it didn't strike me and it didn't get anything going for me. That has nothing to do with the quality of that word. That might have something to do with the quality of my hearer or my seer, you know. And uh, I've been guilty of that too. I'll listen to one person. And I don't know if it's the way they, they deliver the message. I don't know if it's what's going on in my life. But I'll hear it and be kind of like, okay. Somebody else will do something and be like, whoa. But if I make the arrogant assessment, that one's not good and that one is. I think I, that is arrogant. Because if that's the word and that's the word, they're both good. It's, it's more on me to, I might have to work harder to appreciate what's good in this one than this one, but it doesn't change the fact it's still good. Anywho, so, um, won't dwell much longer on that because that we have so many other things to dwell on together, but that, that thing there, that's something that I could say, any of us could say, any time we're about to experience the word, we might just whisper that to ourselves. Let she, let him who has ears to hear. Let her hear, you know, just to remind myself, I've got to hear this on purpose. I won't necessarily hear this naturally. All right. Oh, there's one more thought I had on this. Isn't it interesting that Jesus is speaking to John to write it down for the angel for the churches? And in that lineup that John's given us so far, the Holy Spirit isn't mentioned. But notice what it says in this statement. Let him who has ears, let him hear... What the Spirit says to the churches. You're like, well, Jesus, you're saying it. And I was kind of actually wondering, why did he word it that way? Why not say what Jesus says, or the Master says, or something? The Son of God, you know. But the more I was thinking about the overall flow of Revelation, um, I was reminded that there's a statement in um, Revelation 19.10. It says, it is the Spirit of prophecy 
who bears testimony to Jesus. Revelation 19.10. I thought, there is such an emphasis on the spirit of prophecy in Revelation, maybe that's why he chose that. Jesus is speaking to John for the angel of that church, but it's the spirit of prophecy overall that is giving this whole vision to John. The Holy Spirit of prophecy. So anyways, that's the thought I have. I don't know if that's why. I just thought it odd that he said what the Spirit says to the churches. Let me ask you something. Every one of the churches, you know, the first thing it says is to the angel of the church. Yeah. And you made a statement there a little while ago about who that could be or whatever. I I just look and I I have a note here and I don't know where I got this or who told me this, but I think (coughs) that the angel of the church is the pastor and minister. Is what I have. I've got that. I got that from somebody. That's a common teaching. Yeah. Online. So that that could and that would make sense to the angel of the church of Ephesus, to the angel, you know, to each minister or each pastor of the church. So that could be. Yeah. One of the reasons I don't think that's it is that it, that would be a modern reading of it because in the earliest churches, for the first century especially, there was not a single leader of a church. It was a group of elders leading. That's why that one doesn't ring true for me because it probably would have been plural if that's what he meant. He probably would have said to the elders meaning, or the angels of the church. So that's possible too. That's the thing. We just don't know for sure. But that's one reason I read that as a very common teaching. And uh, it just, to me, it didn't line up. But I could be wrong. I don't know. All right. <clears throat> Cecilia, did you have your pen up to say something or were you just holding your pen? I was just holding Okay. <laughs> I never know. Oh, no. That okay. <laughs> That's all right. You, I just don't want to miss you if you want to say Thank something. You. Okay. So the Spirit is speaking to the churches, and He's doing that today. Amen. And I do believe, in here in chapter 2, verse 7, the Spirit's got a lot to say to this church right here. It's so good. All right. So what is the Spirit saying to the churches? To this church, He says, To the one who is victorious... I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. That's such a beautiful statement right there. Mm. Now, what I want to do, which is going to take probably the bulk of the time we have left, but I want to look at the idea, and the word in this verse in the NIV is victorious. But on that paper, I was trying to just put some things down for you that I found. That the word... That the, in, in the Greek that was used there, it's not that you need to know the Greek really, but what the original readers would have been reading was this word nikao, which comes from the root word Nike. Everyone knows the word Nike, right? That's the just do it, the swish. And that is um, a divinity in the Greek, Roman, Greco world. But the word itself means victory. Actually, it means conquest, most precisely. Conquest. So there's actually a militaristic undertone to this word. Not athletics, though Nike would make you think that. Victory in athletics, you could use it for that, but its, it's major meaning is not athletic, it's military, conquest. Okay. So <coughs> the more I've looked into this, the more I've preferred to read Jesus' word as to the one who conquers. Now, you can also say overcomes like the older NIV did to the one who overcomes. I gave you a breakdown on the bottom of your sheet there by translation, how the translators chose to communicate it. Overcome is a fine word to use. It's used by most of the versions that are... At least, okay, these are the versions on BibleGateway.com. <laughs> there's, if there's other ones, I didn't check those. Fifteen of them use conquer, which again, I said I prefer, but... But anyway, 19 of them use victorious, are victorious. Two of them were off on their own, and they use the word win. But again, win, you can, you can win a prize at, at the arcade at Del Grosso's. You know, that win just is losing something for me if you say win. You can also win by cheating. Yeah, that's right. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> now, again, my, the reason I want to use the word conquer as I'm reading it, and I do that, The reason I use the word conquer throughout these verses I put on this page for you, (coughs) because that word conquer really brings to mind the militaristic undertone, like none of the other ones do. It's not that the other ones don't fit or bad, but conquer helps me. 
It just helps you. And the other reason is this. As I read the book of uh, Revelation, one of the themes that is so easy to miss and one of the reasons I need this book so badly as a disciple of Jesus is it reminds me of the conquest of my master over this dark world. We use the language of Savior appropriately for Jesus. Um, but because of what has gone on in the past, Jesus suffering and dying to save us, it's easy for us to forget the future picture is Jesus will conquer to save us. And we need to have both in our minds. That's what the book of Revelation does for us, probably better than anything, because it pictures him as a lamb who conquers. And by the way, do you know what happened to that lamb? He was a lamb who looks as if he's been slain, but is alive. A slain lamb does not seem like a conquering image to me. You know what I mean? Like a lamb walks by, you're like, oh, great lamb. No. So he uses this imagery of, of the meek and the humble and gentle that had been killed, which seems like it's been conquered. And yet that exact image is used for the one who conquers. Now I want to give you a little taste of this. Um, it's Revelation 17, 14. Will you go there with me? Revelation 17, 14. It is on your paper there. Kind of the paraphrase of it. But I want to look at this. This is so good. Now, who is it that is trying to rise up against the land? It's the powers of earth backed by the power of Satan. The powers of earth backed by the power of Satan. That's really the... If, if I was to summarize the antagonist of our story in Revelation, that's it. The powers of earth backed by the power of Satan. So listen to what John saw. We'll start in verse 12. This is uh, in a chapter that's about Babylon, the prostitute on the beast. Okay. So the ten horns that he saw on the beast that the prostitute was riding, the ten horns back in verse 12, the ten horns you saw are ten kings who have not received a kingdom yet, but who for one hour will receive authority as kings along with the beast. They have one purpose and will give their power and authority to the beast. And the beast has been discussed previously. Now notice verse 14. They, meaning the kings who are there to fight the beast, or I'm sorry, who give their power and authority to the beast, they will wage war against Notice he uses that word, the lamb. What a weird word to use in this context. But the lamb will... Now, what does your tra uh, translation say next? The lamb will what? Defeat. Defeat. Overcome. Triumph. Overcome. Defeat. Triumph, Triumph over. <clears throat> okay. And I noticed that about the ESV in several verses. They used that word conquer, which I like. I like that. But however you put it, he, he wins. You know, how to use that weaker word. He defeats them, he conquers. Now, the reason, again, I like that word conquer, is that's my master. He's not just... And that's why I think the other words leave me with the impression that he just didn't get beaten. Like, they came against him, and he withstood the attack. He, he was still standing at the end. That's not what the word conquer makes me think of. The word conquer makes me think... He's the one in charge, and he's taken over the powers of earth. See, if someone comes against me to take what's mine, and I put up a good fight, I wouldn't say I conquered anything. I just didn't let them conquer me. But, if I say that I go to conquer something, that means that someone else has something, some terrain, some, some territory. I go into their territory, and I take it from them. That's what conquered me. That's who our Jesus is, as is shown in the book of Revelation. Do you know why the kings of earth are rallying against the Lamb? Not to take what's his, to protect what's theirs. The kings of earth are trying to stay in power. They're trying to keep the earth under their power that they've enjoyed for this year that, that John sees. And the Lamb is threatening to take it from them because he's the king of kings and lord of lords. He's, his kingdom and the kingdom of his God is growing in the earth. That's why I like the word conquer. You don't have to use the word, but I just want to make sure we know that's the undertone of that word. So if you're going to see victorious and overcome, beautiful, go for it. But just realize it's not a defensive victory. Whew, survived that attack. 
whew, overcame that attack. And here's why this is really important to me. Because as a disciple of Jesus, in this world that is so dominated by the enemy, and the darkness, and the lies, and the culture of wickedness, I so easily, and it's just about a daily process for me, I so easily have a defensive mentality. I just got to protect what God's already done because Satan's coming after us. You know what I mean? Like, it's with my kids, it's with our church, it's with society in general. It seems like the evil keeps growing and, and it's, it feels like the church is under attack and so I get very defensive-minded. But you know what? The only thing that cures me of that is I go to the Word and I see that it's God through Christ and His Gospel and His church that's actually on the offensive. Because who has had dominance in the world since just about the beginning? Satan. It's been sin and Satan. Not the truth. Do you know the one who has the most to lose is the enemy, not Christ? The enemy has so much territory that has already been taken by Christ. The reason that we see <clears throat> Satan as having, you know, such a seeming victory is because we lose track of history. When Jesus entered the world, there was a pinprick of light in the world. A pinprick. This little bitty thing called Israel. And most of Israel was a mess too. There's a little pinprick of light. The elect, if you want to call them. Jesus enters the scene. And through the message, the gospel, the death, the burial, the resurrection, the ascension to heaven, the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, and the sending out of the church. Do you realize the world has been um, infiltrated with light ever since? It's Jesus who's actually on the offensive. And that's why I bring it up so much. I hope you don't get tired of hearing it. I hope it encourages you. But when Jesus said to Peter, you are the rock, or I call you the rock. And on this rock, different word for rock, one small, one's big. But anyways, on this rock, I will build my church. church. One of the few times Jesus used that word, by the way. And then what did he say about his church? Now the word there, the, the translations say hell, unfortunately. They ought to say Hades, the place of death. Death. Death will not prevail against my church. Now it's the gates of death. Remember, I keep saying this because it's, it's been taught me so long the other way that I want to just keep fighting the, the other way. The gates are not offensive. Gates are defensive. Gates in an ancient city are the weak spot in the city's walls. And so, of course, if you're going to attack, that's a really good place to go with your battering ram, you know? And the gates, the better your gates, the better your defenses, because that's your weakest spot. So if Jesus says, I'm going to build my church, and the, the, the weak spot in, in death's defenses won't be able to stop you, if I could paraphrase it. His church is going to beat down the gates of death, and death is going to try to keep them out. That's language of offense, of conquest. Jesus has always been on conquest. So that's why I like this word, conquest. It reminds me that we're not here trying to win victories against the attacking enemy. We're going out there, and the enemy's trying to keep what he's got. Well, right? I never looked at it like that. That's oh, it changes everything. It changes everything. And I'll be honest with you, that's one reason why I don't act more offensive against the enemy. Because I don't think that way. I'm just like... Back up, enemy. And guess, guess where that really fits is the church in Ephesus. They're really defensive against false teaching. And it was good. Awesome. Keep that all out. But the love that they lacked was not allowing them, probably, to take the gospel much further. Because they're just behind their walls, keeping the bad stuff out. So do we as a church, even, even today, are we all really just kind of holding our ground rather than going out to actually Exactly. Conquer? Yeah, that's right. I, I don't think I was trained to do that. We don't go against the things that are wrong. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. You were going to say something? I was just going to say something about fear. Yeah. You know, but the perfect love of Christ cast out fear. So, I mean, I'm sure they had a fear <clears throat> that they were protecting, you know, everything sure. on the inside. Mm -hmm. So, was that like a driving force for them, other than wanting, definitely wanting to do the right thing. But. Yeah, that could be. I can easily see that happening to a group of people. And so like you said, 
you know, as far as us not standing up for what we need to, is there, there is a fear in that. Mm-hmm. You could list a lot of different things, the reason why there's fear. So, just a thought. Yeah. Are we confusing humility with fear? I think is is part of the problem. Yeah, timidity is not the same as humility, you're right. Yeah, because Jesus, the great conqueror, he said of himself, what? Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. Jesus knew he was humble. He had to be, or else all of us was lost, you know. But he was certainly not timid. Mm-hmm. You know, oh gosh, this story. Talk about conqueror. Okay. So Jesus lands on the shore with his disciples because they crossed over and it's getting dark, okay? It's dusk time. The whole story is really creepy. Anyways, but uh, if you were to portray this in a movie, you could do a really good job of freaking people out. So it's getting dark. They're on the water and they land on the shore near, near a graveyard, a cemetery. And do you remember who was in the cemetery when they arrived? It was a demon-possessed man with a legion of demons in him. And this person is described as being so powerful and out of control that the townspeople nearby, because he was kind of a danger, they tried to chain him to keep him under guard because you can't let this man wander around. Well, the demons in him gave him such an extraordinary physical strength that he would just tear the chains off. And So now I'm picturing he's got these chain remnants left on him because the part that he tore off was in the in the wall or whatever so he's just got these chains hanging off him i'm guessing he looks really disheveled and gross his nails and whatever are growing he's cutting himself too yes he's cutting himself good he's cut he's bloody you know this whole thing so jesus and his men land on the other side of the shore it's supposed to be a time of quiet of rest time to wind down and as as he's stepping onto the shore what happens But this maniac from the cemetery who looks all nasty comes running at him. And by the way, if I was one of the disciples who saw this guy running at me, I'd be like, Master, please step into the boat. It's time to find another location, you know. I'm sure the disciples are really freaking out as they see this in the dark coming at them. But Jesus stands steady, stands his ground steady. And when the demon-possessed man with an army of demons in him Gets to Jesus. Do you remember what he did? Cast him to come out of him. No, no, no. What did he physically do when he got to Jesus? He fell down Mm. on his face. Mm. (coughs) Okay, the demon had the upper hand, okay, because he's running at them, and he's got supernatural physical strength, and yet the demons had enough spiritual insight to know (coughs) that if you get to Jesus, you have to fall down and beg for mercy. That's the man we follow. Even though he's in his physical, human, mortal garb, you know, of flesh, the demons had enough spiritual vision to see, you got to bow down and beg some mercy from this man. Mm-hmm. So the beauty of that story to me, besides the creepiness, is that Jesus had invaded this demon's territory. Mm-hmm. And the demon couldn't do anything about it. The best he could do was ask, could I have the favor of killing some pigs on my way out, you know? Oh, this is who we're, who, we're, who we're following here. So, when Jesus says to the one who conquers, if I may use that word here, to the one who conquers, what he is getting at is that those who follow him are on his conquest with him. And that's why, to me, discipleship has made such a big difference, because I see myself on the move with Jesus, not just holding on to his coattails on my way to heaven, but I'm, on, I'm, I'm in a, a mission with him. In this world as it is, he wants to get something done, which is conquer, and he's enlisted me to do it. I would say this, there are some people who have the right idea, but the wrong way to do it. And this is why sometimes the church has been seen as so forceful in different realms that our forcefulness isn't necessarily supposed to be in everything political and everything all that. We ought to have a presence there because God's word needs to be heard in the political realm as well. But a lot of times we're, we're known for the things that we rail against in public. We need to have a voice, like I say, but we don't need to be railing, you know. We don't want to be yelling at anybody. But that's not even the, the conquest we're supposed to have. We're not. Look at the earliest church. Did the early church have political conquest of any kind? No. 
You know, the only reason that Christianity overcame the empire was because the emperor saw a vision in heaven. Not because Christians had enough weapons to threaten him. The, th- the Christians never really were known for taking up weapons to try to get their way. They didn't. They couldn't go to the ballot box. That was not an option. You know, but there was never this forceful, you, you better do it our way or anything. We're going to force you to do it our way. You know how the Christians conquered? They kept showing this indescribable and hard to explain kind of love. And it really baffled the nations around them, the peoples. They thought they were weird and ridiculed them, but on the other hand, they really respected them and were drawn to something about them. This group of Christians was, uh, this is recorded for us, I don't know who did it, but there's a story of the ancient Roman Empire. Um, First of all, they were known for taking the babies that were put out, exposed. You know, back then they didn't really do abortions like we do them now as much. They would just have the baby born, and if the dad in the house didn't want it, they would just take it out, send a slave out with the baby, and just leave it somewhere. And it would be in a rocky terrain area, and just let, let them die. They call it exposure. The Christians, of course, didn't have any political way to try to deal with that. I do think we ought to have a voice in politics for this abortion thing. But they, they couldn't make any difference politically. So do you know how they addressed this problem? How they conquered, so to speak? They would go get the babies and bring them home. Because their master Jesus told them that these children matter and their lives are eternal. And so they need to be loved. And so they would, what we would call foster slash adopt. Random babies that they don't have any connection to. They just, they know where they're going to be exposed. They go get them. There's another story of the Christians who, um, in one town, there was the plague that went through. This sickness and disease. And the whole place, if you, if you were smart, you're getting out. Because everyone's going to die. Anyone in this town is going to die. And there were Christians who were alerted to what was happening. And they stayed in the city, even though their fellow Christians were telling them, we got to get out of here. We are going to die if we stay here. And they chose, a whole group of them chose to show mercy and compassion to these dying sick people and die themselves rather than save, them, save themselves and leave. I mean, this kind of mentality was unheard of in the ancient world. What is the matter with you people? But that was its power to conquer. So when we talk about conquering as a church, I do not mean in the, the usual ways that people conquer. The earthly methods of conquering are not our methods. We use this spiritual power of love, wisdom, and, and consistency of goodness that over time is like the yeast Jesus spoke of in the parable. Do you remember his parable about yeast? The kingdom of the heavens is like a little yeast that a woman put into her large batch of dough. And of course, everyone in his audience knew what that meant. If you put a little yeast in a large batch of dough, it works through the whole batch of dough. And he had a sister parable to that, which was the mustard seed that a farmer planted or someone planted. And it's the tiniest of all your seeds in the garden, Jesus said. But when it grows up, it's this big thing that's like a tree, a tree big enough for birds to be in. He said it's so big. Now, what was, what was his point about these two sister parables? What was he saying about the kingdom of the heavens? It's going to be small and it's going to be subtle and gradual but it is going to take over. <laughs> I mean, that's what the yeast is, or this tree did. It's going to grow and be this massive, daunting thing. And history has proved him right. No one could have guessed that starting with Jesus and the little band of disciples, 120, we'll say, after he came back to life, who would have guessed it would be the largest I'm not saying everyone in this number is legit, but this is the largest subscribed religion in the world by a long shot. It's in almost every country, every culture, every language has this knowledge of Christ and has people redeemed by the land. You know? oh. In fact, if I could take you uh, to a vision in heaven, I need to find it because there's several visions of heaven and I have to figure out which one I'm looking for here. Sorry. Um... I could just tell it to you, but it's so much better to see it. Let's see. Ah, my memory fails. Okay, to save time, can I just tell you? I'm sure you're familiar with it. But uh, several times John has a vision of heaven and people in heaven and the worship of God and all that. 
And in one of the visions, he says, uh, he saw around the throne of God people from every, do you know? Every tribe, tongue, nation, and people. Seven verse nine. Bingo. Thank you, sir. Go to seven verse nine with me. Yeah, Revelation 7, 9. Look at that. I love it. So in chapter 7, he sees the 144,000. We're going to talk about that. That's a debated thing there, but that's all right. Get to verse 9, yeah. After this, after that thing about the 144,000, I looked, and there before me was a multitude that no one could count. Do you see the conquest here? Jesus' kingdom has absorbed countless people. You consider how many people were actually in the kingdom when he showed up on the scene? That is conquest. Like, there's no doubt about it. From every nation, tribe, people, and language, which is to say the whole world was touched by his kingdom. In his way, he conquered the world, meaning his kingdom spread to every part of the world. What were they doing? They were standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice. We don't have the same translation. I was going to ask us all to read it together. But it says, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. They couldn't help but but acknowledge that the reason they were able to stand here in the presence of God and the Lamb in his glorious place from all over the planet Earth is because they have been saved by God and the Lamb. Right? So this is what, now there's so much to go over on this paper, but I, I wanted to make sure you had these verses so that you can look at these if you want. One of the questions that comes up when we talk about Christ's people conquering, conquering whom? You know, who do we overcome? Against whom do we have victory? And we have a few answers in these verses. These are all, all the times in the New Testament that that word is used. They're not all individually listed just because there's a whole chunk of them, for instance, in chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation, where he uses it over and over again. But there's one word that, that we're focused on, of conquering. <coughs> these are the places it's used. Would you look, for instance, on your paper at those passages in 1 John? It's about starting at the 5th fourth uh, bullet point down. John wrote to the young men because they had conquered the evil one. That's Satan. John said the disciples had conquered the spirits of the Antichrist because the one who was in them was greater than the one in the world. First John 4.4. 4. He declared that everyone who is born of God conquers the world because we have faith. He does not mean you take over the planet. What does he mean by conquered the world? Not the planet. What does he mean? The system, right? The world system. Okay. Uh, the ones who conquer the world, he wrote, are those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God. They're the only ones who can. I have a completely bad typo there. What did I do? I think I highlighted something and sent it into the nether regions. Oh, my goodness. Which one are you looking at? Right under First John 5, 4, and 5. I have this... Jesus promised a variety. I just pushed the space bar. That's what I did. Or the enter. So that's actually a sentence if you put it together. <laughs> Jesus promised a variety of glorious blessings to those who conquer. That's what we're looking at right now in Revelation 2 and 3. I can't wait to look at those blessings with you, by the way. Mm. Mm. If you ever... Oh, by the way, there's an interesting connection between the blessings Jesus promised and his reference to conquering. When, and I, I love learning about history, and I love, I'm really interested in, in conquests, military conquests, partly for this, this kind of thing. But I was reading a book about um, Alexander the Great and other great military leaders like that who, who took over large swaths of the earth with their militaries. If you wanted to incentivize a bunch of, and you needed hundreds of thousands of soldiers to get this done because they weren't just going out for a month and coming back. Like they were going to be away for years on end to keep conquering more and more. If you were going to incentivize men to follow you into battle, risk their lives 
for years on end, what would what do you guess that these uh, military leaders would have to promise their soldiers to keep them going? Spoils. That is why the soldiers kept going, but that wasn't the only reason. I remember reading an episode in Alexander the Great's conquest where a bunch of his men had, were so tired of fighting. They were all kind of agreeing together and commiserating together. They're like, we have conquered enough. We, we've spread the empire of Greece. Like, what is he doing? Why, why do we need to keep getting more and more? Can't we just be done? And they were actually, a large, maybe all of his army, I don't know. But a lot, a lot of his army was ready to just say to him, we're done, we're going to go home, good luck to you. You know, that kind of thing. And this was a book of great speeches and and. The reason that the author gave that background was to say the speech that he had to give to convince them to keep going with him. Now he used, if I remember right, he used an interesting mixture of, do you realize all the spoils you'll get if you keep going with me, you know? But he also had to cast them a vision of the greatness of their cause. Mm -hmm. Because they're like, look, I could die for this. Making a bunch of spoil doesn't totally get me there. So he had to go beyond just offering them stuff. He had to give them a bigger vision of why this will matter to the world. You know, why this is so important. Now, I'm not comparing Alexander the Great to Jesus because it's not even close to a comparison. But I think it interesting that Jesus, as he, as he invites his people to join this mission with him, this conquest with him, he does that. He makes sure we know, I want to share everything with you. I want you to take not just part in the hard work, I want you to take part in the victorious benefits after it's all said and done as well. I want to ask you if you would go to Romans 6 with me. Hey Ron, I'm just going to give you a, a, another analogy to that. Would be, uh, to me anyhow, would be World War II. Uh, the people who lied about their age so they could go fight for their country. Yes. Freedom. Freedom was there was what they saw. That was their vision and they saw that present them. And they were willing and many did die for that freedom. And everybody wanted to go. They knew they may very well not be back, but that didn't stop them from going. They lied about their age so they could go. They, yeah. They did anything they could do. They you know, so they said it was for the cause. The cause was that's it. Because the they weren't going to get spoils of war. There was nothing like that for them. Well, it kind of it seems like a little bit more our time, you know, than, than Alexander the Great. I mean, we right, you're right. We understand World War II and what the cause was and what the reason was and how the people were, were willing to die. Yeah, with very little promise to them, really. In fact, there's some who didn't get in here and they went over to Europe to just... Take in, who will take me? Who will let me fight for you? Yeah, incredible. That happened after 9-11, didn't it? Enlistment went up. I, I knew people connected to me, not known personally necessarily. It was the same kind of vigor. Like, we have to do something about this. But, yeah. I was, because of the greater cause. That's right. I just looked this over about, I saw a vast crowd too great to count. Yeah. And then I think about how that contrasts with narrow is the way and few will find it. Can you imagine, if this is too few to count, what about all those that are lost? You're right. We are far outnumbered by those who are. Yeah. yeah. Yep. I was wrong. Go to Romans 8. I'm sorry. So if you'll go to chapter 8, verse 18. Actually, let's start, start back earlier than that. Verse 17. So Romans eight seventeen. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. Now, notice what he says after that. What's the if here? There's a lot of ifs in the Bible that I don't really like. I know they're right and good, and so I have to get that figured out. But <laughs> when you first encounter them, like, oh man, it was so good until the if. What does he say? We're heirs of God and co-heirs of Christ. If? Share in the glory and the share in the suffering. There it is. 
if we share in his sufferings in order that we may share in his glory. So that's like, you know, because of the spoils of war connection. If you go back to Alexander and he's like, uh, hey guys, spoils of war for everybody. Now you don't have to enlist. You don't have to fight for me. If you just say that you're behind me, stay back here in Macedonia and I'll just send you the glories of war. No, that's not how this works. <laughs> if, you, if you want to share in the, the spoils of the war, you're going to have to be a part of that war. And that stinks. That's hard. That's awful. You know, risky and all that. The beauty of following after Jesus is that what, as we see in Revelation so beautifully depicted, the, if, you, if you want, and maybe some people aren't comfortable with militaristic language, so forgive me. But as you are soldiers under Christ in his conquest, do you realize that even if you die, you win? Amen. There, there's no risk for us, actually. We know we're going to lose from the beginning. We died to ourselves. That's a given. So there's no risk. There's nothing that we're like, oh, I don't know. I do know. I know I'm going to suffer. I know I'm going to get glory. That's what I know. And so the details are fuzzy. I don't know how the suffering is going to happen. I don't exactly understand all the glory, but this I do know. Even if I die, and this is something that we're going to see in Revelation, in the short term, there is a, a loss that we suffer. In fact, I want to show you a few, a few places on your list on this page. If you go down to the, the verse that says Revelation eleven seven. In that part where there's these two witnesses that arrive, and they're they're unstoppable. They have these powers from God that if anyone tries to come against them, they just obliterate, <coughs> they obliterate their enemies. But when they're done with their job, here's what we read in Revelation eleven seven: the beast from the abyss conquers them after they're done testifying, and he kills them. And the whole world celebrates that they're dead. So there's one case in which. God has given them power, they're unstoppable, but then when it's time for them to be done, they're conquerable. You know, they're going to die, just like Jesus. He was unstoppable until it was time for him to be stopped. So it seemed. And then, uh, look at that one underneath that says, Revelation thirteen seven. It says very specifically that this beast that comes out of the sea, which most of us would connect to the Antichrist, he was given power to conquer... God's holy people. He actually defeats them. He does kill them. He does round them up. He does put them in jail. He does all that stuff. And he seems like he's winning. And he goes, well, if we're the great conquerors with the great conqueror Jesus, why do we keep dying? Why is that happening that these people, what was it? Mozambique. Mozambique. Why is it that they're being slaughtered and their places are burned and they're having to run? That doesn't seem very conquering to me. The way that they're conquering is by being faithful to the gospel, by loving their enemies, by doing everything Jesus said and did to do. And as they do that, Satan's power diminishes. Because you realize that people will fall in love with Jesus and want to give their allegiance to him, not because you put a sword to their neck or a gun to their head. It's because you have painted for them, through your words and life, a picture of reality that they haven't seen anywhere else. You've demonstrated something is possible that they never thought was possible. That's the kingdom that has come already, you know. And that's how we conquer. That's why that word has a danger in it if we use it, because the way people hear conquer sounds so aggressive and like, you know. That's not how we mean it as disciples. We mean it the way Jesus demonstrates it. Faithfulness, steady, loving, humble faithfulness, and the enemies of Christ actually become his disciples. That's how that works. We've talked about it. I'm sure you've heard some of the stories. The ones who are persecuting, torturing, and even killing disciples of Jesus end up becoming disciples of Jesus themselves because they cannot understand how that person kept loving them in the middle of it. I heard one example very specifically where a man was hung upside down by his feet and you know how sensitive the soles of your feet are. So this was very purposeful and smart and cruel. And they, him hanging there, they had a, a pot of hot oil above him. And I'll let you take it from there. I don't need to gross anyone out. But as this horrible thing's happening to him, and it's about to happen to him, all he said, there was no cursing them, there was no pleading for his life, there was none of it. All he said was, Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. 
Jesus loves you. And even if I was given a report from someone who had been there, because I was at a conference for a persecuted church, and he said even as the, the, it was going on, even in the pain of it, mm-hmm. that's all the person could say. Oh my goodness. All they're saying. Mm-hmm. Now, not surprisingly, as at least one, I might underestimate this, but at least one of the torturers became a disciple of Jesus right after that. So you say, well, how do we conquer? Just like that. Yes. Because Satan can't hold Satan can't hold that back. There's nothing Satan can do about that. Because what are his weapons? He can get earthly powers to torture you, to take your family, to burn your house down, to whatever he can do. And if we continue to love and be faithful and stay humble, he can't do anything else. Do you remember what Jesus said to his apostles? He was about to send them out on their mission while he was still earthly, uh, mortally alive on their short-term mission. And he said, do not fear those. Somebody take it from there. Who kill the body but not the soul. Yeah. Who should we fear? God. The one who can send both body and soul into hell. All right? Do you remember that? So Jesus knew. What he says there holds such a nugget of wisdom. What's the worst the enemy can do to you? Well, he can. Some would say take your life. Others would say hurt my family. I think some would go there. But no matter what the enemy can do to you, it's temporary. <clears throat> and Jesus will undo it. Amen. He kills you, he brings you back to life. You know? He takes your family, he reunites you to the family. Jesus is the, when, when we read before, he holds the keys of death in Hades. That's one of the reasons why that image is so powerful for us. That's why that image allows us to suffer the worst things and keep going. Because we know that if the enemy pulls the biggest trigger he's got, my Jesus is about to undo it. He's got the key. He's got the final word. It's exactly it. That's what this whole book is about. That's why I wanted to hover on the idea of conquest now. Because you're going to see it all the way through the book. I just don't want to have this conversation every time. We're going to have it now. So that as we go, you're going to be like, ah, there it is again. I'll just say conquest. You're like, yeah, conquest. Yeah. I talked to a guy today. He was uh, from originally from Poland. He's got an accent. Very hard to understand. But uh, he came over from Poland quite a few years ago. And uh, he was telling me today the story that they were, we were talking about, we were talking about religion, we were talking about, I said, most everybody in Poland is is Catholic. He said, 99.99%, yeah. Yeah. And I said, I've talked to some of those guys because they were so oppressed for so long. You know, they were under under the German control, then under Russia. He said that when he was young, that the Russians had had control. Mm Mm-hmm. He said, you couldn't talk about God. You couldn't talk about your religion. You couldn't talk about anything to anybody because if you did, he said they would kill you. Mm-hmm. And so, and, and he said, you couldn't even talk about it to the neighbor's little boy because if he would go home and tell the neighbor, then the neighbor yep. would go to the police, the police would come and kill you. Mm-hmm. So you, you, it, must have, it must have been really horrible. Uh, in our this is in our lifetime and the stuff you're talking about it's it's happening and it's always yes. happening. Now that's just telling them what you can't talk about he came to the United States and <coughs> Yeah. And you can say just about anything you want. Yeah. Such a such a different world. Now in the in the little time we have left, because I want I'm hoping to get to the letter to Smyrna next time, uh, I just want to encourage you with the promise Jesus made. I'm not going to encourage you. The Lord wasn't going to encourage us, but I want to talk about it with you. What did he promise here back in chapter 2, verse 7? What did he promise to those who are conquerors, or those who are victorious, or those who overcome? Well, this is in verse 7. He says, I will give the right to eat. From what? First of all, he said, I will give the right. What does that say about him? If he can give anyone the right to eat from the tree of life. Now just, we don't have a lot of time, but just to review, where's the, where's the first time we see the tree of life appear in the grand story? This is Genesis chapter three, 2. Genesis chapter 2. We have a description of an actual garden. By the way, it says um, the tree of life that is in the paradise of God. I didn't know this before, but the word paradise 
comes from a Persian word that sounds like that, and what it meant was a walled-in or an enclosed garden. So just the word paradise, if you want to be technical, it just means a garden, a walled-in park. Even that was a word that was used, a walled-in park. So, you know, back in Persia, if you said, oh, what a lovely paradise. You didn't mean a place where everything's perfect and no one ever dies. What he meant was, oh, I like your enclosed park. Okay. Now, what the Jews did, when they translated their Old Testament into Greek, because the Greeks kind of borrowed this word from the Persians, what the Jews did was take the word paradise and make it very exclusive to the garden of God. They made it a sacred word. They used a different word for any old garden, any old park. So we have the Jews to thank for making this word have so much punch to it. Because if you say, oh, this place is a paradise, you, you don't mean to say, oh, look, there's walls around your garden. You know, we mean, we mean to say something about its perfection or its just amazing beauty or something like that. Anyways, that's kind of a small point here. The bigger point is that in the book of Genesis chapter 2, what we find out about the tree of life is that God put it where? Where did he put it in the garden? Do you remember? Center. Right in the middle. Yeah, right in the center. But it wasn't alone. What was the other one? In the center. Truth, truth, truth of knowledge. Or knowledge, knowledge of good, good, and good and evil. Now, God didn't. Uh, we don't have any record of God saying anything to them about eating from the tree of life. We have no record of that. We do have a record of God saying, now don't you eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, because the day you eat from that tree, you're going to die. That's what he told them. So, they had this choice constantly in front of them, because they, they were inhabiting the garden. They were caring for it. That was their place. And so, always available to them, they had these two choices, life or death. That was always, is that accidental? Isn't that what God said to Israel through Moses? I put before you the choice between life and death, blessing and curses. It's always been the choice, life and death. Well, when they ate from it, this is in chapter 3 now, we learned something about the tree we didn't know for sure before. All we knew in chapter 2 is called the tree of life. In chapter 3, we find out what that means. Go, go to chapter 3 with me. Because what I want to do in the last two minutes is show you why, or show you some of the significance of the fact that Jesus actually promises what he does here. So in chapter 3, God hands out the curses. But then, after deciding to kick them out of the garden, he had to take one more step. Because I didn't realize this for the longest time. It's pretty recently I realized it. If you think about it, if God let these fallen, corrupted creatures eat from the tree of life and enjoy its benefits, that would have been a huge disaster for his world. Now, if the perfected creatures had eaten, that would have been great. That would have been nice. But if these fallen, corrupted creatures took from it, it would have been a disaster. So look at God's decision. It was very wise. Uh, let's start in verse 21. So Genesis 3, 21. Uh, the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Isn't that nice? He didn't have to do that. That was really kind. Genesis, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> the other it's side nice. of the book. Yeah. <laughs> And the Lord God said, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. So the serpent didn't lie about that. They would become like God in that way. That's 321. Now we're in 322. Genesis. Genesis 322. Oh. <laughs> All the way back in Genesis. Wow. I missed something. There. Sorry. <laughs> so... Man has not become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Still in verse 22 there. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat. What would happen if he did? He'd live forever. Can you imagine the mess that would be? Immortals, corrupted immortals, wandering the earth, destroying everything. What a mess. Oh my goodness. So, what does he do to make sure they can't? The Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the garden. And you've heard the expression east of Eden. They were kicked out of the east side. <coughs> he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim 
And get this, like cherubim aren't enough. Like that, they could do the job. But notice he puts a flaming sword there, flashing back and forth. What is the job of the cherubim and the sword? Guard the tree. Not to keep them out of the garden, even to keep them away from the tree. The tree is what cannot be consumed by corrupted people. Can't have it. That's going to be a disaster. So, so if you think on this with me, if God cannot tolerate corrupted, defiled people from taking hold of the tree of life because then they will live forever in the corrupted, defiled state. What does that say to us? If Jesus says to those who conquer or triumph or overcome or are victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life that is in the paradise of God. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. (laughs) The cycle is closed. What that is, is a statement that your corruption and defilement will be over, totally gone. I can entrust eternal life to you now. And that's something that I had to really have a switch in my thinking. Because I, like a lot of people, like, why doesn't God just let everyone live forever? I don't get it. Isn't that good? Why, Why would eternal damnation be better than eternal life. And over time, and it took so long and so much listening to people that are smarter than me, and finally clicked, because he is smart. Because <laughs> he gets it. Of course, only certain people should have access to a gift like the eternal life because they're going to be around forever. <laughs> That's a really big deal, you know. You could kind of compare so, that to the, uh, if, if that was allowed, it's like vampires. You're right. Yep. The destructive mm-hmm. and selfish. And yeah, there goes the, the paradise of God. There it goes. It's gone now. You know. So, uh, just one more thing because I know we're out of time. But I just want to give you a quick, quick look at this. The past picture of paradise or the garden of God was that Eden. Now, Eden, by the way, is, is uh, not the garden itself. It's the area the garden was in. Eden was like a, a region. So the garden was in that region. That's why it's called the Garden of Eden. It's the Garden in in Eden. Anyway, we do not know what happens to that after the third chapter. We have no idea what happens to it, but it's not there anymore. So I don't know, and and this is what Jews would think a lot about. Did God take it and put it somewhere else? Did it get swallowed up in the earth? Like, what happened? It's like the Ark of the Covenant. What happened to that thing? All we know is it's gone. So the Jews speculated, and the Christians picked this up as well. Where did God put that? You know, some thought it was in the far east, in the far north, in the northwest. They had all these guesses. Some thought it was on the mountain that reaches highest to heaven. God must have put it up there somewhere because they're so sacred and beautiful. We have no idea. The scriptures don't tell us. But we do have this reference from Jesus uh, to a thief on, or we say thief. He was probably more like a rebel, a murdering rebel on a cross. Do you remember what he said to the? The criminal dying next to him that said, Jesus, remember me when you enter your kingdom. He uses that word. That's the word that Jews especially reserved for the garden of God. So we know what he meant. Garden of God. What did he mean? Now, we don't know for sure from the text because he just took it for granted. The guy knew what he meant and he knew what he meant and the readers know what we meant. But I'm putting, I'm trying to put this together that when Jesus told the story of Lazarus and the rich man, Lazarus, who was righteous, when he died, the angels carried him to the bosom of Abraham, which was a place in Sheol, the place of the dead. Now, Jesus, before his resurrection, he had to go down there too, right? He descended just because he's human and he's got to go where humans go when they die. So, I'm trying to put two and two together, and I'm not the only one. I'm not this smart. I'm trying to put the pieces together, and it seems true that the paradise of God in the interim period was where the righteous would be in their death, waiting. But see, Jesus made a fundamental change to things when he died and rose again and went back to Father. So to this day, the righteous no longer have to go to Sheol, a better part of Sheol, mind you, in Abraham's bosom. They don't go down to the place of death anymore. Where do the righteous of God now go when they die? To heaven itself. It seems that the paradise of God was trans, or, uh, transplanted from the place of where dead people went to paradise. 
And now when you get to the end of Revelation, spoiler, sorry, when you get to the end of Revelation, guess what the paradise of God is, is described as being? It's the new Jerusalem, the city of God coming down to the new earth. And how do we know it's the paradise of God? Because it's got the river of life flowing from the throne. And guess what's growing along both sides of the river? The single tree of life is growing on two sides of the river. Figure that one out. And I'm so excited to get there. But guess what happens when people eat? Because Jesus gives them the right. When they eat from the tree of life, it says it's for the healing of the nations. Mm -hmm. It brings restoration. Not just longevity of life fullness of life. This tree just symbolizes every good and eternal thing God wants for his creation. Oh my gosh. So Jesus said, hey, stick with me. Even when it hurts, even when it's hard, stick with me. If you do, you'll win with me. And when we win together and conquer all this stuff, I'm going to give you access to the tree of life that has been forbidden since the beginning. Mm-hmm. And we get to be together forever in that place. So, That one sentence to me, mm, that's something to take home with you, chew on it. When the enemy comes against you, you're like, no, but look what Jesus promised. (laughs) When temptation you promises this, you're like, yeah, but look what Jesus promised. (coughs) Like, no matter what you're offered in the old system, you've got something better that your master promised you. And this is just the first of the seven great promises. Can I read something in reference to what I read to everybody about the persecution? Yes, please. I just found the scripture in Romans chapter 8. It says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Now, No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. Oh, perfect. Him, oh, my gosh. Us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Mm. That's a perfect way to end this. How can people being led to the slaughter be more than conquerors? That's how. Just like Jesus. All right. Well, I hope you're encouraged.